this panel is on partnering. And so Pitt requires that we pay close attention to the impact of technology on human lives and communities, particularly those uh, the most vulnerable and marginalized in society. Pitt invites us to engage those people and communities throughout all stages of a technology's lifespan, from the identification of which community needs technology can respond to, to the design, development, testing, deployment, and governance of that technology. Um, here, members and friends of Pitt UN will discuss how they've established and grown collaborative partnerships uh, with civil society organizations to foster individual and community rights, advance justice, and build resilience. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, what we're going to do is we will go down the line, we'll break the rule, and we'll go down the line in introductions, uh, starting with David here to my left. Hello? It should be, uh, it'll just talk to oh, wait, okay. Hey everyone, uh, it's really nice to be here. I'm David, I'm an assistant professor at UC Santa Cruz where I direct the Tech for Good Lab. I design technologies for education, work, and community engagement. Uh, my interest in PITS started during my PhD at Stanford when uh, we worked on different participatory democracy initiatives. And it was during that time when I also started feeling the tension uh, between academic work that needs to generate knowledge valued in your particular discipline and you know, supporting community projects and needs that often requires you know, working across dis disciplines, having longer term um, engagement for bringing ideas from needs all the way to deployed you know, sustainable solutions. And so um, that led me to some soul searching during my PhD, like, oh, is my PhD worth it? You know, what am I doing? And to finally um, thinking that maybe we could bridge that tension if it's possible, and you know, if I can work across disciplines, if I can develop new models, new organizational structures that can connect research and student learning and uh, advancing community projects. So that's what I've been doing. Uh, since starting my faculty job, I uh, am running several programs for uh, expanding experiential learning for students and trying to connect that to supporting you know, real needs. I have uh, over 100 undergraduate students in my research lab um, outside of a course, and um, I run an exploratory reading group program um, that helps you know, students as early as first years to explore you know, the different ways that computing is impacting society and how um, faculty are engaged with that. And then um, as a Pitt UN grantee, I also have been you know, restructuring my courses to explore this concept of a course-based community consultancy. We organize the whole class around delivering a large project for a nonprofit and also in my lab build tools to think about how we can make that um, scalable and sustainable. <clears throat> so it's been really fun. I've been learning a lot and uh, still learning a lot. I'm looking forward to the conversation with everyone. Um, yeah, this is my first panel also, so I'm a little bit, a little bit nervous, <laughs> but. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, good morning. Are we before noon? I guess it depends on what time zone you're from. Um, I'm Amy Sanders. I'm an associate professor of journalism and law at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, and it's my distinct privilege to be here uh, as a representative of the, of the SCALES Open Knowledge Network. Uh, we are a group of 12 interdisciplinary uh, scholars from data science, computer science, journalism, law, uh, business, engineering, uh, public policy. Uh, whose project uh, is designed to increase access and transparency to court records. Uh, we started the project with uh, very generous funding from the National Science Foundation, uh, and we've continued to do work with funding from Pitt UN, so thank you very much. Uh, we have created a machine learning tool that is designed to do large-scale analysis of court records. Uh, and as some of you in the room may know, Federal court records, uh, which are of course public records, are behind a paywall uh, that require you to pay 10 cents a page to get access uh, to those records. And our initial work has been uh, really important in determining uh, disparities in granting access to fee waivers to get into federal court. 
Uh, and so we've been working with lots of pro bono uh, legal organizations and others uh, to find out what they need to know about the legal system in order to better represent their clients uh, and in order to work with uh, policy, policy shops like Chris's and others um, to change the way we uh, know about the courts and, and how we get access to justice. My name is Nathan Williams. I'm an assistant professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, I work at our Golazano Institute for Sustainability. Um, you know, PIT is a new concept to me, although I've come to realize that it's what I've been doing all along. I just didn't know what it was called. I, I do a lot of work with uh, sort of underserved communities in terms of sort of electricity access and how can we leverage uh, clean, renewable, decentralized energy technologies to uh, sort of close that energy access gap. I've done a lot of work in Sub-Saharan Africa. The project that's being supported uh, by uh, PIT, which I'm very grateful for, um, is a partnership with Navajo Technical University and an organization, a nonprofit called the Energy Sovereignty Institute in New Mexico. Um, and the goal there is to understand how, you know, to create a framework for how renewable energy uh, can be a public interest technology that serves the needs of tribal communities and reinforces their sovereignty. You know, tribes have this unique status in this country as you know, the first people. They're sovereign, self-governing communities, um, but there's a long history of that not being respected, and there's plenty of examples in the energy space where energy technology is being exploited not to their benefit, but actually to their detriment. Uh, and so how can tribes exert their sovereignty over their energy resources to their benefit, and how can that as well reinforce their sovereignty by making them more self-sufficient in terms of uh, their energy supply. Um, and so, yeah, I guess there's a few pieces of this project. We are, one, just, you know, with any technological solution, it really requires starting in the community and understanding the problem as they define it. And so uh, we're doing interviews with tribal leaders and energy professionals uh, trying to understand what does energy sovereignty mean to them? What is the goal? What does an energy so sovereign future look like? We're partnering with Navajo Tech and some of their students as well to do this work. Uh, one of the things that come out of that work very strongly is that education is critical. If you want to be a sovereign community, you need to have the skills and abilities to make decisions inform decisions by yourself and not rely on expertise from other people that might not have your best interest in mind. Uh, so part of what we're doing is uh, working with um, a talented uh, indigenous filmmaker to make a series of educational videos in the Navajo language uh, about renewable energy. What is it? How does it work? How can you benefit from it? Uh, very excited about that. The tribal utility has expressed interest in using those videos. Um, as well as doing some case studies to work through the Energy Sovereignty Institute's network to sort of spread the word on like what are our tribes doing, what can you learn, what are the successes and the failures um, that we can sort of build on to build that knowledge base. Um, and so I'm sort of trying to build that conversation in that community. So. That's on. Uh, my name is Carlton Williams. I'm an assistant clinical professor of law at uh, Cornell University at the law school. Um, and I run a movement lawyering clinic. And I think uh, movement lawyering might not be a thing that people have heard of, because even in the law school, <laughs> when I say it, people say, what do you actually do? Um, but it's really, it's very pit. It, it's connecting, it, it, it's understanding that um, solving uh, social justice issues, um, access to justice issues, we must first start with talking to people who are directly affected by those things, people who are organized in their local communities um, addressing those problems. There are, are so many examples, I wrote down a whole bunch of them, but I'm not gonna do that in three minutes, um, that we could um, list through that, that people tr are trying to address in their communities and many um, organizations trying to address those, but sometimes that that gap, right? Because when we are experts in our fields or so-called experts in our fields, we say, oh, well, we know, right? Like I went to school for a very long time. We went to school for a very long time. I know about the technological solution. I know about the legal solution. I know about the policy solution, right? But I, I said in a very simple way, the person with the boot on their neck knows what the problem is. Right, and I'll just say, because I'm, I'm gonna point to it, and uh, I brought um, a friend of mine from Cambridge, 
just 10 months ago, just about, that's the Wynn Hotel, so a little bit over to the left of that, um, Syed Faisal, um, young um, Bangladeshi American, um, recent immigrant to the United States, um, was killed um, by the Cambridge Police Department, um, I, I think January 4th um, of this year. Um, and that, there are so many issues of attempted technological solutions with that. So like in recent years, police having body cameras um, and many other actually in, in, that, um, in that interaction, police use so-called less than lethal weapons um, to initially uh, try to defuse the situation, um, which didn't work, right? They shot these uh, rubber, uh, metal, or excuse me, wooden rubber coated blocks at him to, um, when he was having a mental health crisis, obviously that didn't help, and then they just shot him with traditional bullets um, and murdered him. Um, murdered is my word. The Cambridge Police Department, the justice system are not using the word murdered um, after an inquest. But um, I worked for a very long time here in Boston with the, um, the American Civil Liberties Union and uh, we, people might know, or I, to brag a little bit about, people might have seen the Netflix series uh, called How to Fix a Drug Lab Scandal. There was a major drug lab scandal here in Boston with forensic uh, laboratory testing on drugs. Um, people were fraudulently uh, uh, giving results on what uh, drugs were in criminal cases. That required massive amounts of data. Um, ultimately, it led to the dismissal of about 40,000 criminal cases um, that were fraudulently, well, I wouldn't say fraudulently prosecuted, but based on fraudulent um, evidence that was presented. Um, but that took, when we first started that, and it was a bunch of lawyers, and we said, if we have 40,000 records, they're also in four different departments, and they're not, I'll just say technology, they're not keyed on anything, because there were police report numbers on this side, and on the other side, there were like lab numbers, and nobody decided to join them. So it was a massive effort, um, brought in many, many data scientists um, to try to solve that problem. But in all of those, every time I've been involved in a project, I've always said, we need to talk to the people who are absolutely affected, who are in the courts, who are or were the criminal defendants and say, and their families and say, what is happening to you? People who are organized in communities, it, this was in Western Mass and also here in, in and around Boston, how we can try to fix those problems and what things people are encountering on a day-to-day -day basis um, for those, uh, for those social justice issues. Um, I'd, be remiss if I didn't say it. I'm also uh, an expert in residence here um, um, at the Spark program with uh, with Ziva, um, and we're doing work on right now a project to um, to document uh, the internal affairs records, salaries of uh, members of the Boston Police Department. So when there are positive things that happen or negative things that happen, and journalists, um, public defenders, prosecutors want to know who is this officer? Has he? Has she, have they been in trouble before? Are they one of the people who makes, you know, a line level officer in Boston that makes $300, $390,000 a year? That does exist in Boston. And why does that person make that much money? Not to say that that, that just seems a lot of money for a police officer. Um, so that we're, we're developing that, data, that database, um, putting it online, getting that through some public records and collecting it from other areas. Um, and we'll soon be ready. Um, some of the stuff we're working on, but understanding that you know, working directly with directly affected people who are organizing their communities is always where the answer is gonna come from, always. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Lewis. I'm uh, uh, the president of Public Knowledge. We are not a member of Pitt and uh, UN, uh, but I've been reading and following about you guys over the course of the, the last four or five years. Um, and uh, what we are is we're a policy shop, as Amy said. We're based in Washington, D.C. We're a public interest nonprofit uh, working on internet and tech policy uh, and law. And um, uh, I think I'm, I'm on this panel of kind of to represent the broader civil society groups outside of Pitt UN, uh, which is interesting because it, there's a diverse set of groups outside of the just the Pitt UN part of what I would consider uh, the public interest community. So the, you know, there's the Pitt UN types, the researchers, the academics. Uh, there's folks like us, um, I would count New America because we work with them all the time, um, who are diving into policy, uh, talking to policymakers, uh, working in coalition to get at answers. Um, yes, doing policy research, but often built on the, the academic research that many of you do. Um, and, and we also have a large uh, cohort of colleagues who have other strengths and weaknesses that build out the field, folks who uh, have uh, grassroots 
organizing um, activists, um, uh, uh, small sectors of communities who care about public interest values but from a specific perspective, be it a, a racial, racial justice perspective or a, uh, uh, I, one of my favorites is the fandom community. Uh, you talked about open access uh, to, uh, to government records. We, we try to dabble and work on some of that, but we also work with the fandom community who wants open access to creative works because they build on each other. Um, and how do you get policy that allows that? Um, the library community, I can keep going on, where uh, folks who touch folks on the ground who are using technology, that's a whole part of the civil society public interest field. Um, and then even folks who do direct services, uh, and one of my favorite uh, parts of that community, uh, that is growing, and rightfully so, is uh, what we refer to as the digital equity movement. Uh, these are the folks, uh, when you hear about the digital divide, and, and we fought in Washington for billions of dollars to help get people connected to broadband, um, these are the people who are on the ground in communities, who are in and of communities. Um, helping people get connected, helping them to sign on to subsidies to get broadband, helping them get devices, learning how to use these devices, learning how to use broadband so that communities can uh, use technology for its highest and best public interest uses. So civil society and uh, the public interest community is broad, uh, and I'm glad to be up here representing it. So um, rather than starting with the three pit UN technology projects, Carlton, I'm going to go back to you. Um, and, and, and Nathan, I would ask you specifically to be ready to respond as well, because um, I think we talk about direct engagement with people directly affected as a principle. What does it look like to actually go build a good partnership with the community? What do you need to be thinking about? Where are the pitfalls? And, and what should this community be thinking about and keeping in mind as they, as they embark on these kinds of community-based partnerships? Many things. Um, so first, I think we're all part of communities, right? And I'll say the thing that I say to my students, right? So when students are in the law school, first year, second year, third year, um, or other you know, LLM students or, or people getting um, other uh, legal degrees, I say, you're in this community. Most people, I mean, in Ithaca, most people are not from Ithaca that are going to, to Cornell Law School. Um, very few are. But I say, you're in this community now. There are things that are happening in this community that you know about, that you may want to do when you graduate, um, that you're interested in, that may direct you, uh, affect you directly, right? There's a, a tenants' rights movement going on in, in Ithaca because rents for being a small town are wildly $4,000 for a two-bedroom apartment in a, a town of 30,000 people seems expensive to me. Um, so there's a, a, a strong tenants, and many people are being sent out of their homes because um, Cornell students are, can pay, right? So people realize that sometimes, they realize that they're involved in it and they're like, we should try to do something about this. And so we all have that impact on the world and, uh, and maybe we're impacted or maybe we're maybe causing that um, or doing both. And finding out what those things are, right? So if you are, let's say, you're a student here in Boston um, and you're not from Boston, find out what's going on in Boston. Find out what is connected to you know, where you came from before, what things you were interested in, maybe your religious community, ethnic community, linguistic community, um, racial community, gender. There's so many things going on. There's a protest going on. Actually, I just got a text when I was on my way here because someone's like, you have to represent these people tomorrow in Cambridge. But, at a technology company, you can find out about it. I'm not going to talk about it because we're going to get in a big argument. But there's a protest going on right now at a, t a weapons technology company in Cambridge, right? And a bunch of people are getting arrested at that, right? And I have to know for a fact because they want me to represent those people that most of the people are not from Boston, right? Um, but those are things, there are so many things going on anywhere you are anywhere, and being connected to those communities, being involved in those communities, finding out what's going on in those communities, um, and expanding that circle, right, is something I think just for us to stay healthy is a, like a, a sort of um, ethically and morally healthy is an incredibly important thing. But also, I always, when I do this, when I go to meetings and people are like, oh, it's really great, you know, you're the lawyer and you came here. I'm like, I'm here to find out what's going on. You're doing a thing for me, right? Um, for a long time, I uh, volunteer taught a class at the South Bay House of Corrections, which is a, the jail facility here in, in uh, by South Bay Plaza here in Boston. And I volunteer taught a class with, with some other folks. And I, I would tell the students, I say, I learn, I know so much about internal jail security <laughs> because I would go through it. And then a lot of times our students wouldn't come to class and they were like, oh, unit H is on lockdown. Oh, why are they on lockdown? Well, they found this something somewhere. And I'm like, so the whole unit is on lockdown? They're like, oh, that's what they do. And 
I know that. I wouldn't, there's no manual that I would have read that about. Um, and I would tell my students, I said, we learn so much from you. And it's not, I'm not trying to be gracious or friendly or nice. I'm saying we actually learn from you. You learn from us. And in all circumstances, you're going to do that. And I think valuing that is an incredible thing. But also leaving that the same way as you might go to the gym, the same way as you might get a coffee in the morning, being involved in community in whatever way and understanding that that's a part of what we need to do to do the work, the technological work, the legal work, the policy work that we do. Right? And I, I think it can seem like too much time sometimes, but it's, that is a necessary thing and it will, it, you will be better at what you do if you spend that time, if you spend that time and make those connections. Nathan, if you want to maybe pull on that string and talk about you know, what that looks like across time scales, geography scales, and the work that you're doing. Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I do a lot of work with uh, under-resourced communities that are not my own, that I don't come from, and you know, I think uh, I don't have a blueprint for how to make that work. <laughs> I think it's very unique to the situation and the context, um, but it is something to be very careful about. I think it requires a lot of patience, uh, a lot of humility, <laughs> Uh, that you know, sometimes we think we've identified the problem, and we have to listen when they say that's not the problem, right? Um, you know, I, I think working with civil society is crucial because we get pulled in lots of directions as faculty members, and we don't have the time to spend on the ground on the front line uh, that people in civil society do. So having those partners that are sort of your ears on the ground and can make that connection and and help establish that trust too. I mean, working with indigenous communities, there are good reasons why they shouldn't trust someone like me walking into their community saying, I'm gonna solve your problems. Nothing scarier, <laughs> Nothing scarier than somebody showing up with a clipboard right, in a lot <laughs> yeah. of communities, right? They're here to help. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I think it requires a lot of caution. It requires good partnerships. It requires building trust in communities. I, most of, I work mostly with PhD students doing research and most of them come from the communities that my work is trying to serve and they understand things that I don't understand. Um, you know, the student working on this pro Pitt UN project is from the Navajo Nation. She's a member of the tribe and so, um, you know, and the other thing that I've found is that, you know, people, uh, complain sometimes it's difficult to bring students from these communities into academia. Um, I guess my experience has been if you give them opportunities to do work that speaks to them, that's meaningful for their communities, that's how you bring them in. You don't just hope that they apply to do your work on, I don't know, quantum physics or, you know, which is great, important, um, but, you know, not going to get everybody excited. Um, you know, so I, I guess that, you know, Patience, partners, humility, um, and you know, bringing in people from the community to be an integral part of the work. And so, we'll, we'll, D David, Amy, do you want to comment? Chris, do you want to comment on this one? Well, I think um, I, I really liked what everyone said. I think one thing that um, I, you know, feel from my own experience is just taking that slow, deliberate approach to building long-term relationships and finding ways to create alignment. Um, I think that. One of the first steps we took when we started, you know, feeling like, okay, maybe we're ready to connect our student, you know, process to supporting community projects is we actually first started by running a matchmaking program where we would, you know, interview community members, understand their needs, and instead of serving directly ourselves, we were helping them to navigate all the existing programs that already exist on campus, helping them, you know, reach out, make those connections, and actually by viewing it as, you know, maybe our project can support these other projects, that enabled us to learn about, you know, the different needs, figure out what's the right partnership that can have a long-term alignment, and while we're doing that, we can actually, you know, be delivering value for the community members at that time. I think that was really helpful. Yeah, and there may well be these disconnects between the time scales of technology and the time scales of engagement, right? You know, technology goes fast, engagement is slow, right? Um, so Amy, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see, if, do you wanna pull on these threads and talk about, you know, because you're actually building the tool Absolutely. Right, in partnership with the community. If, and then, and, and David, I'm gonna come back to you because you're also doing some tool building. I wanna talk about tool building in this context, but please. So I think one of the real challenges that, that presents itself when you're working with community partners, um, and I would say pulling on what everybody said, m my personal keys are respect, and curiosity and acknowledging the position of privilege that I'm in. 
um, because our partners are journalists, our partners are public defenders, our partners are folks doing pro bono legal work. It's really easy for me to sit in the ivory tower as a tenured professor and say, oh my gosh, my life is so busy. I have so many things I need to do. In fact, we've, we found ourselves doing that a little bit at the table, making excuses for why these connections can be so hard. And, you know, my community partners, our community partners, have fires raging around them. Like, anyone who's doing this kind of public interest work knows that, that there are really, really massive problems happening that my partners have to attend to at that moment. And so I have to be really good about explaining to them that we can't build a machine learning tool overnight. I have to be really good at respecting the fact that when they don't get back to my email, it's not because they don't think the project's important. It's because something has caught fire that they have to attend to, the protest across the way that they have to go to immediately to help the people who are arrested, right? And so when I get that time with them, I have to respect that time. I have to you know, make that time as valuable as possible. And so I think you know, for me, it's always asking them, what can we do for you short term? What can we do for you medium term? And, and what would you like from us long term? And I think being open and upfront about the work that you're doing and the limitations of the work that you're doing. We're fighting a battle with the federal government right now because they want us to keep buying access to court records. And so we have partners who are saying, well, it's great that you've got 880,000 dockets, but we actually need these you know, 150 over here. I have to be transparent with those folks and say, I want those for you too but you don't have the money and we don't have the money, so I'm gonna to have to go find the money and that's gonna take some time. So I, I think that relationship, once you build the trust, honesty is so key to that relationship and not over-promising because these, these folks that we're working with have been disappointed so many times. Like, I can't be the one to do that again. Yeah, in, in, a, in the project I worked on once, we did a qualitative and mixed methods analysis back to the people that we had partnered with and the number one question that came out was, what are you not telling us? Right, and it's in, in start stopping and thinking about what am I not telling you because I think you understand it or I think you have that knowledge already is a really good place to go. Um, so David, David didn't talk about his work on coordination costs, but his, his, one of the things he's doing in the tool space is around coordination uh, costs that would otherwise be managed by hierarchies. And so I'm curious, how, do you, how does this interact when you actually do a project with a nonprofit? Yeah, um, so maybe to explain a little bit about um, my work, one of the things that I am really interested in is how to design organizational structures that connect, um, you know, integrate in students who are still learning um, and actually be able to connect that work to the um, projects and advancing um, progress even when students are coming in and out and there's a lot of those um, coordination costs. I think that um, there's so many different levels, I would say. I think like within a class, you know, in a particular quarter, there is thinking about, you know, how do I take this class and divide them up into different teams and, you know, how in a particular week, I might have students working on different roles that build on each other um, instead of the traditional like one homework assignment you know, for that week, and um, designing that to um, build so that someone who's learning the first time, the second week, they can repeat and learn, or if they are already kind of mastering that, they can now take on the role of a mentor um, in the second uh, week. Then there's also like across quarters and thinking about how, you know, if you have students who are there for one quarter, and then they're gone, um, that can be a big cost for the nonprofits, a big uh, barrier. And I think that I like to think about the projects not as one quarter projects, but as multi year. That I, you know, I have this uh, student cohort that is you know, working on this, but then the outcomes they produce, we want to design in a way so that the next class can take it and build on it, or the next year or my research lab can you know, connect with it. So just really thinking about um, 
all those different levels and how to make that continuity. Be a decent segue to, to where I think I'd like to have the, the panel spend the last 10 minutes, and I'm going to, Chris, I'm going to call on you. A lot of projects get funded. A small number of projects become organizations. A small number of organizations become institutions. And I think Chris is the leader and steward of an institution. Right? Public knowledge has been here for a long time. It's been in matrix with a lot of projects, a lot of communities, a lot of organizations. Um, I'm sure that's not easy. And so, and, I, and I'm going to raise the S word of, of sustainability as well. So, what raise can, it? Yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry, man. Um, That's the nice word. But what can, like, what what can you talk about? Cash, yeah. money. Yeah, doesn't matter what business you're in. You're in the cash business, right? The if you're making payroll, and, and that's but that's part of the challenge of, of of doing this kind of work is the nonprofit has a different set of goals from the community, has a different set of goals from the project. And so, can you sort of talk to us about that tension and what you've done at PK? Uh, t to manage across that. And then I invite everyone else on the panel to just start jumping in and ignore me once Chris has had his words. That's, that's hard. I could, you could just on, um, uh, let's see, where do I start? Uh, yeah, we're 22 years old as a policy shop. And so um, in the digital rights tech policy like tenure, we were founded uh, when everyone was really optimistic about technology. Oh, open technology, the internet's gonna change the world. Um, and um, it means that a lot of the values that we've worked on for years and continue to work on, like open access to information, uh, uh, people think differently about them now, now that we've seen some of the harms that the internet brings. And so uh, the way that's manifest for us is that we've seen the field change and also the funding go in different directions. And so um, uh, there's competition for funding, there's um, competition for projects, and then there's just the fact that uh, the, the pace, the speed of, of policy work um, is different than the pace of, of technology, and it's definitely different than the pace of what's happening on the ground with people who are impacted and using the technology. Um, so you have the, the pop-up fires that people are talking about, you know, real problems that are happening in community. Um, you have the, the fast pace of the technology, and then you have the disappointment when change at the policy level takes a long time. And so institutional dollars are really important to make sure that um, the power that needs to be built to change and make policy uh, is there over the course of a decade, decades even, because the fights keep coming back. Um, and you don't want to disappoint a community when they say, hey, I thought we solved this eight years ago. Um, or worse, um, sometimes we see, uh, because of the way technology is changing, uh, the values are being lifted up, and it may not all be about openness and access now, and now it may be about uh, accountability uh, and content moderation and, and bias, and rightfully so. Um, how do you get the money and the institutions to take that long look and think about balancing those values because you don't want to lose what the technology brings as a benefit, but it needs to be accountable um, for how it impacts communities. So it's a real challenge um, to align those. I think it takes cross um, cross uh, sector conversations, uh, and and it'd be great if uh, funders fund those cross sector conversations so that the different parts of civil society can align the timelines that we're on, and even the values that we may be lifting up. One group may be working on one value, but not another, and they need to see how how they interact with each other. Because uh, I guarantee you, in Washington, and I'll stop on this point, I guarantee you, in Washington, that civil society only wins when we band together. Um, I'm up there, I used to be a registered lobbyist, I now have some who work for me. We have a handful of public interest lobbyists in Washington, D.C. Uh, each company has like hundreds that they contract out for. And so sometimes we're on the side of some industry players, sometimes we're not, but we are always outgunned. And so uh, we're successful when we work in coalition and we, we consolidate our power. Anyone on the panel want to jump in? I'll join in on that and say, I told you that we're, uh, uh, Scales is a, a group of over a dozen academics. Uh, we're a dozen academics at seven different institutions now. Um, we're at, at Texas Northwestern, Georgia State, 
University of Richmond, um, oh my gosh, I'm embarrassed, I'm forgetting the others. Um, one of the things that we have really thoughtfully done in terms of leveraging powers, um, Texas is a, is a Hispanic serving institution. Georgia State uh, is a, a historically black serving institution. Um, find your partners and, and leverage everything that you can leverage to reach out to funders, to get benefits and access to communities. Um, we realize that the technology that we're using, um, and we're creating, is, is really going to impact historically marginalized communities the most. Um, and we also realized very unfortunately that most of us working in that space do not belong to one of those communities. And so how do we use our students and leverage their knowledge, right? How do we bring those people and train the group of leaders that's gonna replace us that has that knowledge? And so I think thinking outside of your little sphere and finding people who have um, that lived experience uh, makes you stronger. And, and we've had to bond together because some of our institutions are quite small uh, and don't have resources to get federal grants. So fi find your partners and treat them well. Go ahead, David. I think um, one thing that I find really helpful, and I'm, I'm a novice compared to you know, where they are, where I'm starting to feel the tensions of needing it to be sustainable, but I found that it's really helpful to try to find ways to integrate with other things that exist out there already. Like when we were doing, um, some of our user research projects with nonprofits, it was really helpful when we discovered that you know, the Santa Cruz County grant making process for nonprofits required the nonprofits to have you know, thoughtful reflection on their metrics for impact and to be talking about how they're using those, that data for um, iterating. And so we realized that if we could adjust our user research process to help the nonprofits uh, position themselves better for the you know, county grant making process, then that was providing value for everyone who's kind of creating all these alignments and incentives. Um, and so I've just found that finding ways to think beyond like my direct partnership to how that can help them connect better with other people just creates a lot of um, help for sustainability. I can jump in briefly. I, as the other junior faculty member on the panel, uh, early career. Yeah, well, depends on who you talk to. But, <laughs> but you know, I mean, there is, uh, you know, building these things requires patience, it requires time. My university media department loves this sort of thing. My tenure committee doesn't, I mean, they say they care, but do they really care? <laughs> you know, what are we getting rewarded for? Is this work something that's actually being appreciated as sort of a primary outcome, not something we'd sort of do nicely on the side, in addition to our publications and our teaching and all these other things? And so, you know, I think there's some thinking to do at an institutional level. How do we view this work and how do we reward it? Um, or is it something we want to incentivize? Because sometimes it's not, I mean, it's something I want to do, so I do it, but it's not necessarily. As a plug to funders, it is rewarded when we attach it to funding, so help Absolute. us out. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will second that, patient funding. Yes. Yeah, they should make funders wear different color name tags. Um, <laughs> you'll never be alone at lunch. Um, so we're, we're gonna take audience Q&A in a second, so please, if you have, something that you, you've got in mind, start thinking about a question and, and looking for someone with a microphone. But Carlton, I'm gonna ask you, as we end, right, we've talked about what's hard and what we have to do, right? You've been in a lot of these community partnerships for a long time. Like, what, what's the upside of this when you do it right? So I'm just gonna say, um, I, I frequently when I meet, I'm gonna use the word civilians, like people who don't do this kind of work, um, they go, oh, it must be really depressing. You know, you're working with like Muslim communities that are being oppressed and immigrant communities that are being deported and people, many of my colleagues work um, on, on death penalty issues and people who are being executed, literally executed. Like how depressing is that work? And I, 
I'm always very confused by this question. I'm like, but if I just watch, if I watched the news over the last three days and I wasn't like able to do something, it would, I would lose my mind. I would be like, I can't, I'm not gonna leave the house, I'm gonna stay under the couch and, and curl up in a ball. But being able to leverage technology, being able to use the law, being able to you know, do trainings and, and, and educate people. Over COVID, um, I, I have an identical twin brother who's also a lawyer, so it's, if you can have an identical twin, it's a good idea. And also I hate the saying when people say, I, you know, there's not two of me. If there's two of you, you have like five times more work. Um, but we, we got a call from uh, folks from uh, the Wampanoag uh, community here, uh, indigenous people here on Cape Cod. And they said, you know, we, we go clam digging on our traditional lands that we don't, not treaty rights, we have aboriginal rights to it, like before any treaty. They were like, we were never, that was never taken away from us. So they go clam digging regularly, right? They do it on very, very, very wealthy people's beach access. So you can imagine what happened. There's a lot of amazing videos on the internet of these things happening. And they said, can you do a training for us? And I was like, about clam digging? And they were like, no, about access and like what rights we have and how we should engage with the police. I'm like, engage with the police? I got you, we know how to do this. That same week, we got a call, my brother and I got a call, or a call or email or somebody called somebody from uh, f some women in uh, Western Massachusetts and in Boston, Massachusetts who are sex workers. And they said, we are regularly harassed by police. Um, they, fake, uh, they make up charges to arrest us and they force us to do things. And I was like, holy shit. Sorry, I was like, That's, I didn't know that. That's horrifying. And they said, can you help us? And I'm like, whatever, I'm gonna say exactly what I said to them. I was like, whatever the fuck you need. I was like, we will do anything that you need. Thank you. And, and even right now, like it makes me tingle. I'm like, this is, like I get to do this. I get to do this, right? And that I feel blessed to be, um, and I'll say actually this, because uh, it's, we judge people by appearance, but I am, so I'm African American, and I'm from the Narragansett Nation ancestry from, native from Rhode Island. And, when all of the people came on the phone call from the Wampanoag Nation, which is our sister nation, right? I looked at him and I looked at my brother, we're on Zoom, and I was like, <laughs> it's funny. And they were like, why are you laughing? I was like, because you all look like our cousins, right? Because all of the Native nations, I don't know if people know, the Native nations in New England are for historically for a very long time were mixed with African Americans because when, when um, I was going to say escaped slaves, but I say freedom seekers. When freedom seekers, you know, actuated their own freedom, they, people fled and they went to indigenous nations, right? So those are our answers. So I'm like, y'all are our cousins, right? And to me, like it just, even saying it now, it just warms my heart to be able to do that. And I think that understanding that and understanding the value that comes from that is, is it's just a, a blessing to be able to do that and to have some degree or some funding or some training and to be able to do that with communities is, uh, is just incredibly encouraging all of the time. And, and I just feel lucky. So when people say, thank you for helping me, I'm like, this is what we do. Yeah. This is what we do. So let's get a quick round of applause for that sentiment. And uh, we're going to work our way just across the room until we run out of time. So please. Hey, everybody. My name is Leah Alexander. I work at Meharry Medical College. So we're a historically black academic health center in Nashville, Tennessee. So I just got here, and I don't want to cause a whole bunch of problems. First, I want to say thank you to Elena from um, Swanee because that's how we kind of got our first introduction into this. We were an early partner in their data science lab stuff. Um, and then also I need to recognize Black Tech Futures because without that work and that group, I don't know that this would have been prioritized for us. Um, but at Meharry, you know, we have a real strong commitment to community engagement. I'm in, I'm in public health. I don't know nothing too much about tech, but I do know public health. Um, it makes me nervous when we're talking about underserved, under-resourced minority populations, and they are not in the room. So I really want us to you know, find some time to think about what other strategies might be um, so that we bring our partners with us, right? So for the panel, because um, I do want to make this a question, what would it look like, you know, the resources that you need for you to bring your partners with you? 
I have colleagues, and I try to do this myself when there's resources. I don't want to go talk about my research in the community without a plan to build capacity of my partners. And that means bringing them with me when I go places if they you know, are interested. And it's not just a token thing, but it's a commitment, right? So I know we're, hopefully I'll be invited back next year. Um, but it's, you know, resources for our community that we're working with. This room is wonderful, but it feels very academic to me. And we're talking about underserved people, and we're doing them an injustice by not having resources for them to be with us. And correct me if I'm wrong, y'all seem real professional and academic, but I could be wrong, <laughs> right? I could be wrong, but thank you. But, but, but I think the question is, Thank you very much. I think the question is, what, is it, what would it look like? Yeah. And so let's, and we have another question, we have a couple of other, but let's, let's run through that real quick. I think that's a question that we want to answer. Well, can I, can I start? Because this room is very professional and academic, um, but it's a great room. And so as long as you know, we're asking that question and answer, I think we can get there. Um, when I talked about cross-sector or cross-value conversations, that's what I'm talking about. Um, there are some places where this is starting to happen, but we have to go, we need to invite folks here, we need to go to where they're convening, and we need to go in the community. And, uh, uh, you know, just in, you know, I don't know health sciences, but just in the internet tech space, you know, where I go to connect with folks. You know, the, the digital equity movement that I was talking about, folks who are on the ground helping people get connected, they have a conference. It's called Net Inclusion, run by the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. It's my favorite conference to go to every year, because I'm one of three or four people who does policy work and advocacy in DC, and there's 800 people there who are touching lives. Um, uh, internationally, there's RightsCon uh, that has a mix of tech, uh, but people like me and people who are on the ground touching folks, um, but it's very diverse and it's a global community. Um, uh, we need more of that and we need the, those sorts of conversations to be funded on everyone's turf, I guess is where I'm going. So very quick and then we'll take one more question. I, one of the things that, that I think is really important, uh, and I'm speaking to a room of academics, so I'm gonna say this and I'm gonna piss y'all off. Stop using free student labor. Write students into your grants because my students at the University of Texas at Austin are working 20 hours a week so they can feed their families and so they can send money back to their families. They can't work for free. And so if I'm not paying them $15 an hour, they're going somewhere else. And so we don't get to com communities by bringing in students to work for free. So stop doing it. Because we can't make them pay for internship credit to work with us. That privileges rich people. <laughs> Funders insist that there is student support in your grants. All the students on my research team come from the Rio Grande Valley and I love working with them, and they connect me to people that I would never, ever otherwise be connected to. We start propping students up to become academics, to become leaders in undergrad spaces. And you do that by paying them and giving them meaningful experiences, not by making them work for free. Yeah. Amy, that's how, that's how I lose. Uh, I go in at law clinics and we recruit those students, folks from hopefully from your programs, to come do policy work, and we'll train you to do policy advocacy. But I don't know how many students at Georgetown's clinic or NYU or wherever, or, the, or Howard, uh, where they do an internship with us, but then they're going big law. And it's about the money. We have time for one more question. Hi, um, my name's Hannah, I go to Berkeley. Um, my question is for Chris. How often do you have your public interest lobbyists package their concerns to meet the needs also of corporate interests? And when do you have a hard line to say no? Yeah. That's a great question. Because uh, I'll just speak for public knowledge, but across the field, like our money comes from a mix of philanthropy and corporate donors. 
Um, the way we handle it is we cap how much we'll take from any one company, and then we tell the companies, you don't get to determine what positions we take uh, or what issues we advocate on. If you're in agreement with us, we'll work in coalition with you because power, consolidated power wins in DC. Um, and so we've had companies walk away and come back a decade later, and it's just, we live with it. Um, so that's how we approach it, but uh, you have to be structured and you have to be funded in a way that allows you to do that. Um, yeah. So I'd like to say thank you again to our panel. Can we get a round of applause, please?